Well, Suzanne, um, thank you so much for your patience and for uh, being willing to do this. You know, I know you're, you're a legend in the field of uh, Native American rights and activism, and uh, your help to me was substantial for this book, so I really appreciate that. Wow. And I, I wanted to start um, sort of near the end, and then we'll go back and deal with a lot of different subjects. But, you know, I I was fascinated by the play that, that you and, and Mary Catherine Nagel wrote about uh, Jim Thorpe, uh, basically the struggle over where he would be buried in his bones. Can you tell me about the origins of, of that play and, and your involvement in it? Well, I saw where um, the Autry Museum had a short play contest. And it was a few months out, maybe two or three months. And so I called Mary Catherine and said, uh, should we do a, a play together, a short play for that contest? And um, she said, well, on what? And I said, how about repatriation? And she mm -hmm. said, well, I started something a while back on Jim Thorpe, but I didn't get anywhere with it. And I, um, and it was just about the, the controversy over his body. And um, so I said, well, let's go with that. So we did. And, and and um, wrote a play, a short play, uh, with that as a as a jump start, and we were. Uh, that play was chosen. I think they chose five uh, to present in um, in staged readings, not full production, but a staged right. reading. And ours was one of them. And then they chose one to go forward uh, with a full production and it was not ours. But, I mean, we were very happy to be uh, among those uh, chosen and we could, uh, I, I couldn't go myself, but uh, MK went to LA and um, was there. I'm sure they loved having the writer there. <laughs> Uh, during the rehearsals and the like. And um, then in the meantime, we, I don't know exactly how we did this. Maybe, maybe I contacted Native American Rights Fund and told them we had this play because they were, oh, that's, that's right. Uh, Native American Rights Fund was doing uh, was helping the Sac and Fox Nation with um, and and two of the the Thorpe sons, yes. the two who were living, <clears throat> um, with a campaign to bring Jim Thorpe home. And I said, well, what we could do is where you need the play done and need some attention to the lawsuit and whatever else goes with it, we could be part of the kind of PR campaign and have um, the play read, a staged reading in various locations and um, have a panel discussing it and question and answer from the audience a pretty easy thing to, to uh, put on as long as we didn't have to act or direct. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but what we did do, um, we had to change. Oh, so everyone said, oh yes, that's great. And we had to change the play with every location because hmm. we had a, there was a different emphasis in the lawsuit. Uh, there was a different audience. Uh, the the um, the circuit court, the appellate court in Pennsylvania, uh, the federal appellate court was one target, and we 
did the play, uh, a local director in Philadelphia directed and assembled all the actors and they did the staged reading and um, John Echohawk from Native American Rights Fund, myself, uh, the chairman of the Sack and Fox Nation, uh, one of the cultural rights people from Sack and Fox, and uh, Richard Leventhal and Lucy Fowler Williams from the Penn Museum um, all were on a panel. So we were talking about this from in in legal terms, in in anthropological terms, archaeological terms, uh, repatriation terms, and um, just um, you know giving the reasons that Jim Thorpe deserved to go home and that he wanted to go home. He always spoke of himself as being buried in uh, Sack and Fox country. Mm -hmm. And um, so his wishes should have been, should have been obeyed, should have been followed. I mean, that no one speaks for the deceased uh, like the deceased. <laughs> and um, uh, instead, on the last night of the ceremonies at Sack and Fox, um, and it's really the most important night because in front of all the witnesses and the, and the relatives and friends and more other mourners, the, his name, his Indian name is returned. And that means it's, it's no longer his name and it can be used again by someone else or others in, in uh, the nation. And, um, you know, he would be remembered by it, but also other people could use that name. Um, so that's the last step before actual burial for the second Fox people. And so they were finishing that ceremony and in through the doors that are only used during that ceremony to, to uh, go out. That is, it's only used for the deceased to, to leave, um, for the spirit to leave, for people to take the remains and, and go out to the burial. His um, third wife showed up uh, with big, strong people and a big car, and they um, took his body, took the coffin, took his body, and she drove around with it, uh, putting him on ice and uh, until, I mean, keep in mind where they were. They were in Stroud, Oklahoma, not too far from where he was born. And um, right, so, oh, maybe half an hour, 45 minutes to the east of Oklahoma City and kind of northeast crowd. So she drove him all the way to Pennsylvania to a town where he had never been, to two towns actually, and they were willing to change their name to Jim Thorpe. And we never could find out how much money was, was exchanged, that there was money exchanged. Um, it, it's not, it's more than a good guess. So, um, I agree. Yeah. She, it seems like, you know, they paid her and she dropped him off and, <laughs> And they built a roadside attraction where he remains today. So, yes. uh, uh, the so we had all of these. Um, I know this is a very long answer to a short question, but we had, um, I think, about ten different iterations of that short play, uh, 
uh, for different purposes. Uh, there was a sovereignty conference, uh, the, the one at, at, at the Penn Museum at UPenn. Um, we thought would be a prestigious school for the judges on the appellate court to pay attention to that something was being done on this subject and and um, you know a clerk might even show up there that kind of thing and who knows if that happened or not but they did not um, rule the way we would have wanted um, and we had there were we did the same sort of thing in Oklahoma uh, at the Sovereignty Conference. Every year, the Oklahoma Supreme Court does um, a Sovereignty Conference, a Native Sovereignty Conference. And so I asked them if they wanted, um, the, asked the, the main judge who works on that if they wanted to um, host this play, and they, she said, oh, yes, of course, Judge Cogger. And um, so we did the play in the, the judge's building, um, which has a beautiful theater with a glass floor that actors always hate performing on. <laughs> you slip and slide. But... Um, uh, beautiful, beautiful setting, and uh, and they had everyone there to see the play and to have conversation about it um, before they had what they were hosting as the opening reception for for the whole symposium, and it's a it's a really important symposium nationally. And especially important in Oklahoma because you have, uh, because the, the Oklahoma Supreme Court is, is sponsoring it. So mm -hmm. you have lots of judges who are interested, tribal court judges, state judges, federal judges, and lawyers who are interested and tribal leaders. And it's a real mix of um, people. So. Uh, that was another place we <coughs> wanted to to show this, but we also did a guerrilla theater kind of thing of uh, taking it to a mall and showing it that afternoon. Um, same cast, same local cast, and this was an all native cast and native director because um, it's Oklahoma and that's where the Indians are. <laughs> so. Um, uh, they did uh, a, a staged reading there in the mall and uh, then redid it in the Grand uh, Theater of the Oklahoma Supreme Court Justices. And we did one in, in Washington after uh, the First Lady had her um, uh, meetings with, with uh, or convenings with, with philanthropist and also with students, there was a big unity, uh, youth unity conference in a hotel in DC. And so we cast, um, and this was one that we did pretty much direct ourselves. And we cast um, high school kids, native high school kids, uh, in all the parts, which was really interesting. And that was one of the best performances. They were just great. So it, anyway, we we had, but every step of the way, um, things would have changed and um, yes. someone from the campaign would say, do you think we could emphasize this more? And was, oh, sure, no problem. <laughs> we do a quick rewrite and update it, and we were just trying to get as much, um, um, draw as much attention to the campaign as we could, and to give, you know, the Thorpe brothers and and um, and the Sack and Fox Nation 
a leg up um, uh, wherever it might be needed. Sure. And so it, that's that, that's sort of yeah. that play. Yeah, well, it's a, I mean, I've read it. It's a very powerful argument and play. Unfortunately, it, it, you know, um, it spread the word, but it didn't affect the uh, United States Supreme Court's decision on not to hear the the appeal. So right, right. I'm afraid that that issue is kind of uh, over with now. But the the larger issue of repatriation of so many thousands of Indian bones is still an enormous issue, and you know. Even at Carlisle, they're finally starting to repatriate some of the, the bones of the students who sadly died there. Um, One of them is um, my mother's great aunt, who's buried. Is that right? Her name. Tell me about that. Her name is um, Washta, Washta, which is Washita, uh -huh. the river and the massacre. Uh, yes. site in Oklahoma, and her agency name was Elsie Davis, and she was 16 when she contracted tuberculosis and was sick for about six months and um, was scheduled to go to uh, the Chicago World's Fair and to be one of the student exhibits in in the Carlisle classroom exhibition where they replicated a classroom um, and took students. So she died and um, when, before she died she had done an etching of the Cheyenne version of the Morning Star, which is our a very important uh, symbol in our cosmology. And uh, there's a distinct way that the just uh, the, the Cheyenne people have of um, showing the Morning Star. And it's where Cheyennes, where just our people come from and where we go when we return uh, to Stardust. <laughs> and um, so it, it's sort of like she had a premonition that she would die. And um, anyway, that so that was, um, that etching was on the wall of that exhibition during the Chicago World's Fair. And I've never seen it. But and she was already dead by that point. She was. Oh. And um, Do you remember what year that was, Suzanne? Approximately. Uh, was it ninety three? I think. Um, yeah, I think that's ninety three. Okay. Yeah. Um, her. So it, and and her. Her. Um, Passing was noted in the pub the publications, a couple of the publications that they did. Mm -hmm. Now her older brother, uh, Thunder Flies Around, who was also known as Thunderbird, and his agency name was Richard Davis. They were the two youngest children of uh, Chief Bull Bear, who was the head of the Dogmen Society. Uh, when the Dogmen Society families comprised over half of the Cheyenne Nation and comprised the, the Cheyenne resistance. And <clears throat> so Chief Bull Bear had several, uh, several children and grandchildren at Carlisle and because Pratt, uh, the, the superintendent of Carlisle, uh, was like a Plains Indian groupie. He loved the Plains Indians, which is uh, what he 
is the profile that he pushed on all the other Indians. <laughs> so they, even those who didn't have that kind of profile, that kind of headdress, that kind of mm -hmm. leather and feathers <laughs> um, outfits, uh, had to have them because he loved the way the Sioux and and Cheyenne and Arapaho and Kiowas looked. And those are the people he spent a long time trying to kill. Uh, he wrote... Um, Let's get, just a second, Suzanne. Let's get back to the relative who died there. She was buried in the cemetery there? She was buried in the cemetery and they got the year wrong. Uh -huh. 1893, yep. and she has a headstone. Yes. Um, and on her her Cheyenne name is not on it. It just says Elsie right. Davis, yep. and the year in Cheyenne, and um, but the year they have is five years out. Um, That's not surprising. A lot of the names are misspelled. Yes. The tribes are wrong. They have the Christian cross, whether they were uh, religious in that sense or not. Right. Um, that whole cemetery is kind of a travesty in so many ways. Well, and she, so she and others were buried, and then they were exhumed. And yes, they, um, oh, because they wanted to build the art building. So they built that. They and reburied the those children, and then they wanted to build a road. So they exhumed them again and built a road, and then they exhumed them again to make way for a stadium, and then supposedly uh, reburied them in the historic cemetery. Um, so I don't believe that all of them were reburied. Hmm. And I do believe that the students were mined for their body parts, just like the, um, like their relatives were being mined for body parts at home uh, through the Army Surgeon General's Indian Cranius exactly. Study, uh, and through the Army Medical Museum and the Smithsonian Museum, as it was called at that time, uh, efforts to harvest Indian skulls and bones and grave goods, as they called them. And they even advertised in the Rocky Mountain News and other newspapers um, for people to go out and harvest uh, these for their collections and the, just send them to either one of us and we'll divvy up the, the goods. And so they got a lot of their collection there as well as the oh, 4,500 skulls that um, were studied and here, here's their scientific study. They would, an army officer, all the army medical officers were, um, you know, in an outpost in the West, were tasked with um, a quota of, of skulls. So, and I think some of them were, were I think some of them may have been um, killed for their heads. Uh, Mangus Coloradus, for example, the Apache leader. There, there's much in the literature about he has a huge head. He has a really big head. And um, the army officer's report is, uh, and these are written reports, um, as soon as the shot body fell to the ground, I immediately decapitated it and found and, and weighed the brains and measured the skull and found though the skull were smaller, the brain were larger 
than that of Daniel Webster. So that's a heck of a lot of information for an army officer uh, to have uh, at the ready, you know, as, as soon as the shot body fell to the ground. Um, <clears throat> so this sort of thing was going on and um, by the time we forced the Smithsonian Institution in the 1980s to have a um, to have a, a an inventory. Um, they had 18,500 human remains and um, 4,500 skulls, and that was um, in 1986. And how many do they have now? Um, I'm not sure what it's down to. Uh, but you've been able to repatriate many of them? I think many of them have been repatriated. Um, have all of them? No. Have most of them? I think not. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, it's kind of slow going because yeah. immediately they disassociated um what they called the grave goods, the funerary objects, and we changed that whole lexicon in um, in repatriation law, um, mainly because you know I kept hearing you can't legislate respect. You can't. Well, what you can do is force people when they're when they're acting within a certain law to use a certain language. So we changed specimen and bones and skeletons and all of that to human remains. We changed grave goods to funerary objects and sacred objects and so forth. So um, it, it's as close as you can get to legislating respect by just forcing people to use uh, non-racist language. Exactly. So, Suzanne, yeah, yeah. we could talk for hours and hours about any one of these subjects. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love, you know, to listen to you. But let me let me move on a little bit, OK? Um, I want you to tell the story about your father and the dinner table. <laughs> well, Dad went to two um, boarding schools. He was taken to Yuchi Indian Boarding School in Sepulpa, Oklahoma. Um, and he was, uh, after that, he went to Shilako, uh, Indian Agriculture uh, uh -huh. Boarding School, where he met my mother. And they fell in love. And then he went away to war. She went away to Haskell. Uh, boarding school, and they um, uh, they got married after he got shot up at Monte Casino and uh, uh, returned as a war hero and a disabled veteran and had to go back to Shilako Indian School because he was uh, had been taken when he was a sophomore. And so he, he went back and um, and boarding school looked better after being in war. So he went back and finished his high school, um, got his high school diploma um, in, in the year after the war. So he, he graduated with the post-war group. And um, when he went to Yuchi Indian School. He spoke Muskogee, and that was his language. And he could speak because of ceremonies and get togethers. He, and he was a really fast learner. He could speak a lot of the other Muskogee languages uh, Seminole and Choctaw and Chickasaw. And, Alabama, Cushata, you know, they're just a whole raft of them. So 
<laughs> he began in, in school um, just like he'd be in a lunch line. <laughs> Sorry. He'd been in a lunch line and um, he'd say to the kid next to him, Buck's changed, Javon, let's go eat, boy. Which is the polite way, the thing you would say to someone coming to your house or someone when you're out someplace, you're inviting them to get in the, the line for the food. And... Um, so he'd get beat up for that. And by who? By the disciplinarians, uh, the teachers, and the disciplinarians. They were all disciplinarians. But it would either be the, the teachers, the matrons, the, the proctors, the um, um, people who ran the school. And, and they would beat him up because he spoke in Muskogee? Yes. And, and he didn't speak English. So I, I asked him what he was beaten with, and he said with boards, um, with one-by-twos and two-by-twos. And that's a bat. When you're nine years old, you're not much taller than a bat. And that's what they were beating him with. So um, he... figured out that you're not supposed to talk in line. So then he didn't talk in line and he would be seated at the table and ask someone to pass something or he would pass something to someone else or offer some food to someone and they would beat him up for that. We thought, okay, you're not supposed to talk around food. But he heard everyone else talking. You know, okay, you're just not supposed to talk your language. You're not supposed to talk Indian. You're not supposed to talk Muscogee around food. So he said that was pretty much an incentive to learn English really fast. And he did. Um, and, you know, when he went away to war, um, he, and, he was with the 45th Infantry Division, the Thunderbirds, and they, uh, with com in, in Company C, um, and they used to, you know, how the, the companies are A, B, C, Abel, Baker, Charlie, well, in Oklahoma, it was A for Anadarko, B for Bacon, which is another school, and yes. C for Shalako, because that uh -huh. uh, almost all the boys um, in Company C were from Shalako, <clears throat> and um, and they were. Uh, Dad was one of the one of the hubs for the. Uh, code that they developed. They weren't like the Navajo code talkers who overlaid, uh, overlayered the Navajo language atop a code that was developed by the Marines. Uh, the, this was a wholly different kind of um, organic code that they figured out in basic training and on the troop ship to um, North Africa, and they based it on the coordinates of Shilako, mm. and, you know, where you had a lake, you had this kind of hiding place and that kind of hill, and, um, and everyone knew the directions of this and that, and, and they, um, they used as many words and phrases as they knew of the students who went to Shilako. So even though none of them, or only a couple of them were Pueblo 
and they didn't really speak their language that that well. <laughs> <clears throat> They were, um, they would, all of them, all the students, irrespective of, of how fluent they were or how conversational they were, they all knew words and phrases and had relatives or could describe someone who looked a certain way that, uh, and that, so they would use that aspect of that particular person in that particular student's family, you know, now soldier's family, right. to mean Italy uh -huh. or to mean Italians or, and then, you know, on this would mean Nazi and that would mean, so they um and they became rather famous for it in north africa and their superiors would uh, approach them and say okay we need you know reconnaissance and you go here and you go here and here are some walkie talkies and just talk to each other <laughs> and uh, so th they did that and yes. and um, so this was it, it's so ironic that the language that that they were beaten up for um, and tortured really for speaking or singing or thinking uh, in was um, part of what helped win the war at, 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 in Europe and um, in, uh, in the Pacific theater, because lots of these, uh, um, almost every native nation in the United States uh, had some sort of code, even if they were only using their words for, you know, word for word, and it wasn't strictly speaking a code, they were just using their language, uh, they still had um, some sort of code. And, and then out of these boarding schools, uh, you had that mix of language where uh, you developed a code that could never be broken. Uh, at, under any circumstances and dad used to say that they were perfectly schooled to be um they were perfectly schooled to be um prisoners or to be soldiers uh, by their experience in boarding school uh, because they they learned to withstand torture they learned loyalty to each other and uh, never to uh, turn each other in or um, rat on each other. <laughs> and, That's very powerful, Suzanne. And Prisoners. They, they were not or, afraid to, yeah. and they, they could evade the enemy. Yes. So that, the, that, that's- The trauma of that early experience um, at when he was beaten for speaking in Muskogee when he at the at the table is something that you noticed about him for the rest of his life, right? Sure. I and so even you know after he graduated from from Shilako, then the army. Um, had a recruitment for disabled war veterans, especially those who uh, they could teach cryptography and how to decode and how to make up codes and decode them. And so dad was part of that um, in the army and he w he learned lots of different languages at, at the Presidio at Monterey, for example, uh, 
uh, uh, three dialects of Chinese and the Korean wow. language in 11 wow. months. It's a total immersion thing. But um, so, and, and he picked up European languages like, like they were um, his second language. So, so how many languages could he speak? Well, I'm not really sure. Uh, I know it was at least nine. Um, um, it depends on how you count the, the sure. Indian languages. Um, but he, he was, um, and, and he spoke a pretty sophisticated language, um, you know, to, to be able to um, write code in sure. those languages. It had to be pretty nuanced in the language. So um, that was his orientation. And even with all of that, he and his perfect uh, diction and grammar and, and so many languages, he um, only stuttered in one, and that was Muskogee. Hmm. And why? Well, because that was the one he used to get beat up for speaking. So, uh, and it, he didn't stutter in ceremony, which was interesting. And he didn't stutter when he was singing in Muskogee. Um, but just talking in a formal way or talking in just a conversational way, he stuttered. And from that experience, too, the other lasting thing was that he really had a hard time eating and speaking um, at the same time. I mean, it just, he couldn't do it. He couldn't talk at the table. And whenever we lived with mom and dad, sometimes we were raised by our grandparents and on the east side of Oklahoma and on the west side of Oklahoma. Um, but mom and dad took us to the garden spots, to Hawaii and Naples, Italy. And uh, and that was always great being with them in these fabulous places. And so he would, um, when we all lived together, uh, my brothers and, my, and myself and our parents, we would, it, he developed a routine where he would ask us questions and we would have to, whatever it was, we would recite something. We, he, he loved poetry. Um, he would ask about um, what was going on in the world, what was going on in our school, what was going on with friends, uh, what, um, what did we think of this or that political figure or cultural figure or Elvis Presley or you know, whoever it was the, uh, whatever occurred to him. And so he would generate conversation and he could eat that way. And it really helped us. And I didn't notice that that was the reason he was doing it. I knew that what we were doing was different from a lot of my friends and that we had a table that was very active and, and um, inquisitive and curious and all of those things. And that we were expected to know stuff <laughs> and to, and to uh, be able to uh, call so we were learning all sorts of great skills um, from his inability to make conversation himself around food. He just couldn't do it. And um, at times he would just kind of pull back from the table and go into another room 
Um, which, I mean, we didn't attribute that to anything. We thought that was just his way. <laughs> um, but it, when we really, my brothers and I really were the beneficiaries of my parents, our parents having gone to boarding school and having had some pretty bad experiences uh, with abuse and, uh, you know, just emotional violence and physical violence and uh, torture and all of those things. Um, you know, in, in addition to being malnourished and, uh, you know, all of the things that go with uh, that kind of setup where, where people are buying um, food on the cheap and uh, you know, not the best cooks in the world, and uh, you're, you're kind of eating slop and that sort of thing. So, it, and my parents, our parents, really made it a life mission to figure out with precision how they did this to us, and how that happened, and dad would say, like my mom would say, well, in our way, in the Cheyenne way, this, this, and the other thing. And he would say, that's not Cheyenne, that's Shalok. <laughs> and she would say, uh, well, you know, that's not Muskogee, that's Yuchi, <laughs> Indian school. And they would, they were each other's ears and, um, Hearing that was pretty amazing. Um, what what they were able to do. Yes. Um, again, I could talk about that subject forever too, but <laughs> let's move on to another one. I know that you've devoted a lot of your, among the many many things you've done, um, you've been a leading spokesperson trying to change the racist mascots of athletic teams. Um, when did you get involved in that? And how do you feel about how things are changing now? Well, I don't remember getting involved. I, I've just always been involved. Um, okay. our, right. our family, wherever I was living in Oklahoma, Everyone hated Little Red at the University of Oklahoma, and called and everyone called him the dancing idiot, and um, had all sorts of why I hate Little Red stories and jokes about him, and um, and he was Excuse always. Excuse my ignorance, but who who was Little Red? Oh, I'm sorry. The the um, University of Oklahoma's mascot. You know, the uh -huh. University of Oklahoma, it used to be that all these schools just had colors. Um, so uh, Oklahoma was big red, the red and white. And so yep. they had to have a diminutive um, name for a mascot. And they always had a white guy playing, portraying uh, an Indian. They called that mascot little red i see so and, it was supposed to be an indian yeah. right and who would go out and uh do something that they thought was a native dance uh, on the football field and later they had a compromise and and um and said from now on we'll only have indian boys um, <laughs> be little red <laughs> so um so the 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 movement to get rid of little red um shamed them out and <laughs> whoever was chosen and they would drop out and another would be chosen they would drop out and mm -hmm. finally um everyone mobilized across um across the OU campus and many other campuses and and I uh, had a real um, cross-cultural um, 
coalition of um, you know the Black Students Union, the Chicano Students Union, the Women's Union, um, everyone who was trying to press their rights in the 60s um, joined up and everyone had their own kind of issues with uh, this not so much the sports world but but advertising world and tokenism and mascotting and um, native people were backing Chicano people and getting rid of Frito Bandito uh, who was a really annoying racist um, cartoon and uh, the Chicanos and, and the Native people were backing um, uh, the Black Student Union trying to get rid of uh, Sambo's restaurants and did eventually. Um, so these were all really successful things. Now, I, oh, and, and Little Red um, was the very first one in, in uh, in American sports to um, to die, so uh, that was the first dead mascot was was Little Red, and that was in 1970. Well, I had been kind of recruited for the no mascot movement in um, 1962 by Clyde Warrior, who was a Ponca um, celebrity in Indian country uh, in Oklahoma it, because he was a fancy dancer and, and a very important powwow dancer and everyone knew him and he was um, and he was the head of um, Oklahoma uh, what was it Oklahoma Indian Youth Council and was starting with some people from the Northwest and from Nevada and other places around the country, the National Indian Youth Council. So part of his recruiting for NIYC and for the Oklahoma version uh, was at our high school in, uh, in Oklahoma City at Harding. And he um, spoke to our school and met with the Indian students and, um, and really energized us and informed us uh, about the seriousness of that issue. And he um, stressed, you know, Little Red just has to go and we have to take care of that. And, um, but the worst one is the one in Washington, D.C., right there in the nation's capital. and. The way he talked about the Washington football team and that horrible name, you would have thought that they lived and played underneath the Capitol Dome. <laughs> and that was sort of the image that we got. And so I was fully prepared to um, do something about or help do something about uh, getting rid of that one too. But uh, so uh, Clyde Warrior really was, you know, in addition to my family and other people that uh, they, they knew they didn't like Little Red. And if you really pressed them, they could say why. But they didn't have a way of articulating it in the same way that um, that Clyde did. And so in addition to Clyde being a very handsome man, <laughs> we were all going, oh, he's really cute. Um, it, he was um, an intellectual and was someone who was quite an orator. And so we were really privileged to... Um, um, be schooled by him. Uh, he didn't live, he, he died very young and did not live to see the end of Little Red in 1970. He, he died in the late um, 1960s. But um, 
that really was his victory. And, and he had, the people he had been working with were uh, on campuses where they got rid of their mascots too, Stanford and Dartmouth and Syracuse and um, Marquette. Yep. So, but it was a long fight to get rid of the one in Washington. It certainly was, and and it continues because there still are some teams in the country uh, that have that same horrible name, although we got rid of it. Every um, college in America, we, we've gotten rid of that word as a as a team name uh, in every college. And we've gotten rid of over 2,000 of the, um, of all of them, all of those um, sports references, uh, mascots and names and slogans and behaviors, the tomahawk chop and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, in from 2,000 different locations, different schools. Um, and there are still about 1,500 left to go. No kidding. Yeah, so, yeah. but they're dropping. Names like Braves or whatever? Yeah. At, yeah. And some still the R word, but, but not any... Mm -hmm. Uh, higher education schools, uh, just some high schools, and but they're they're changing fast. And every time you have a, a I mean, we knew when when we were contemplating filing suit against the Washington football team that we would probably not win, but we could help a lot of schools, a uh, lot of Native people who were fighting the battle at home in their schools, you know, some two and three generations fighting, um, and that every time we would make news that we would see changes, and and that that's exactly what was happening for um, the 25 years that we were in litigation, uh, 17 years in our lawsuit, and then um, oh, about seven uh, active years in the identical case that I organized um, with Native young people. Uh, between the ages of 18 and 24. So, um, you know, but for a combined uh, continuous um, litigation of a quarter century, um, where we actually won almost everything, we uh, never lost on the merits, and we would only lose on technicalities. And, uh, but nonetheless, they're a loss. But every time there would be something happening in our lawsuit or in the subsequent lawsuit, we would have 50 to 100 and sometimes more schools changing their names. So it was a really important um, uh, strategy and, um, I mean, we, it, it, it was calculated. We knew what we were doing. Yeah. What, what, what do you think was the tipping point for finally getting the Washington football team to change? Well, I, you know, depending on, well, there's so many. I, Okay. They, they, it took a pandemic. It took mm -hmm. all of us watching George Floyd mm -hmm. murdered. 
-hmm. before our eyes. Um, and most people in the world have never seen a dead person, let alone seen a person murdered in front of them. And that's what we saw. And that was, I think that shook a lot of people to their core. Um, it shook the people from who controlled Aunt Jemima to mm. their core. It shook Fred Smith, uh, the owner of uh, FedEx, to his core after being hard-hearted and uh, just messing with us for about 10 years and not doing anything to um, keep FedEx out of the management and promotion business for the team and being its main enabler. But something happened there and, you know, then of course, an economic meltdown. The, the cheerleaders and their, yep. um, their openness about what was happening, the women who worked in the front office uh, bringing their complaints of, of sexual harassment to the minority members of the owners, the minority interest owners, Fred Smith and the two others who own 40% of the team um, of the franchise. Um, that I think had a lot to do with it. Uh, the general disgust, uh, as I understand it, um, on their part about Daniel Snyder, um, he's just not a very well-liked person. <laughs> and, <laughs> An understatement. <laughs> and, and, so it was a perfect storm of a lot of different factors. A and, lot of different factors yeah, and yeah. what, and I mean, we knew who he was. Uh, he he bullied us no more than Jack Kent Cook had. We sued him first, yeah. or John Kent Cook. Uh, but still, he bullied us, and then really, really was nasty to us, and and did a lot of very underhanded things. Um, the the lawyers did. Uh, went out, for example, they went out to uh, Pine Ridge and Rosebud um, in South Dakota to Sioux Reservations. And they went to the One Star family. And the One Star man was um, their, their ancestor was a student at Carlisle in the 1880s, early 1880s. And that's whose identity Lone Star Dietz stole with, uh, exactly. with the, the assistance of uh, Richard Pratt and Pop Warner. Um, Pop Warner who uh, recruited and all sorts of ringers who were not native and who were not even teenagers. Suzanne, Pop Warner is the villain in my book. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. He just... Um, and Lone Star Dietz was not really an Indian. No, he was not. He was not an Indian. Uh, despite the, the Washington football team's propaganda that he was a full-blooded Sioux and he wasn't. He had two parents who were German, German-American, uh, that he was from South Dakota. He wasn't. He was from Wisconsin. Wisconsin. And um, that he was a beloved coach. Well, how beloved can you be to last only 11 months? <laughs> that doesn't sound like a really beloved guy to me. <laughs> But he was there when the Boston Braves became the Washington Redskins. He was. He was. Yeah. And probably um, it, Pratt didn't like that term, Redskin. Uh, Pop Warner seemed to really like it. 
and Dietz was an accommodationist to warn her. Mm -hmm. And um, so th those, um, you have that, that identity theft which showed up in our lawsuit with the, the trial judge overturning, in our case, overturning the three trademark expert judges, uh, 146 pages of, of uh, unanimous decision in our favor. <laughs> um, and, and the way she started off her opinion was that w with the team propaganda, that he was this um, uh, Lone Star D, that the reason they were honoring us and not offending us was that Lone Star Dietz was native. He was a full blood Sioux from South Dakota and beloved coach. And they wouldn't have named a, uh, used a bad word or a dishonorable word uh, because of how wonderful he was and they were trying to uh, promote him. So, it was all a fraud. It was all a fraud, and which they, the Daniel Snyder still hasn't copped to. Um, so they went out, two of the lawyers from White and Case went out to, um, to Lakota country, and I got a call from um, a friend of mine who was the attorney for Bob Goff, who was the attorney on, on a lawsuit about Crazy Horse malt liquor, uh, the Tioshbae, the Lakota extended family of Crazy Horse did not want his name used, uh, especially not for uh, malt liquor. And so they got that taken off the market. And but they were fighting that battle, and the the one star family was a part of that. Was part of the descendants of um, Enchanted Horse, Crazy Horse, and uh, and so there was a a belief that Lone Star was related to the one star family. Or yes, was that... right, because he had. Um, he had falsified his right. his credentials and taken on the um, the the identity of one star yes. James. Martin. So the lawyers went out to Lakota country and to try to do what they went out with lots of clothes with the R word all over it, jackets and oh. everything. And they wanted Mr. One Star to sign something saying that Lone Star Dietz was his uh, ancestor and that they had no problem with the name and they wanted to honor their ancestor. So um, Mr. One Star was telling me about, oh, Bob Goff put him on and um, so he was telling me about the clothes. He said, oh, our kids love the clothes. He said, it's a real cold day here. And they put on sweatshirts and they had t-shirts and they have sweatpants and they have a jacket and they have hats and they have everything. And, and it, everything's really warm and they're playing and they're all really happy. And then he, he said, these lawyers gave me their paper and so I told him I couldn't sign that because it wasn't true. He said, so I said, we'll take the clothes. We'll keep the clothes, but I just can't sign your paper. And he said, they went away with really long faces. <laughs> I thought, how tacky uh, trying to go out there and bribe them through their kids and, you know, to get some sleazy thing like that 
Uh, Horrible. I, I, sh I will say that in our 25 years of litigation, they never produced a single Native person on their side who would withstand court scrutiny. I mean, they didn't even try yeah. because they they were just coming up with people who were fakes, who were um, just, it was obvious when they would open a door that they were fakes. And they, um, so, it, and they were attacking us as um, people who had no support, even as they were trying to keep out the evidence of our support. Um, in, in one case, uh, uh, trying to keep out of evidence an amici brief by the National Congress of American Indians, National Indian Youth Council, National Indian Education Association, and TICAR, which is Tulsa Indian Coalition Against Racism, which was founded um, to get rid of the R word team as a team name of Union High School in Tulsa, which didn't give it up until um, after the Washington team changed. Path Lit by Lightning, The Life of Jim Thorpe is available online and at bookstores on August 9th. Visit davidmarinus.com to order your copy. This has been an episode of the David Marinus Ink in Our Blood podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and that you'll subscribe to the Ink in Our Blood podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or whichever podcast service you prefer. If you loved it, we'd love it if you left a rating and review. Ink in Our Blood is produced by Metamorphosis.agency. Music has been written and provided by Monika Ryan. Ink in Our Blood is hosted by Sarah Marinus Vandershaft. Thank you for listening. <laughs>